This morning, we focus on the subject of our local ocean surroundings and environmental justice, issues that have been personally integral to me for more than half a century. I well know saving our coast and its inhabitants is a matter close to the heart for many of us, and certainly for me as a Marine Mammal Center rescue volunteer for the last six years. I ended an oral argument some years ago before the Regional Water, Control, Water Quality Control Board with the words, you get what you preserve. You get what you preserve. I'm very excited for an illuminating presentation today from someone I know shares my perspective. Rebecca will light the chalice here in the sanctuary. Those of you at home are invited to light your own chalice now. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope as a sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. Before the opening hymn, let me remind our remote participants to leave yourselves muted. However, we want you and whoever is with you to sing with us as big and loud as you like. Make it a joyous experience. Please stand in body or spirit and sing the opening hymn, We Celebrate the Web of Life. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Community of Cambria. We are glad you've joined us today. Our UUCC sanctuary sits on land that the Salinan and Chumash indigenous peoples historically inhabited. We honor their contribution to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to gather in faith on their unceded territory. Let us respect their legacy and protect their history as we occupy this sacred space. As Unitarian Universalists, we celebrate religious diversity and welcome all who journey in search of faith and spirituality. The UUCC is a lay-led congregation run by the democratic process. We invite speakers from different religious traditions and spiritual and scientific backgrounds to speak at our pulpit. We encourage presentations covering a variety of topics and areas of interest that connect with the UU7 principles. Today's service centers around the seventh principle. We affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. My name is Ted Key, and I'm your worship associate for this morning's service. I would like to extend a special welcome to today's guests and visitors. We're glad you joined us this morning. If you wish, please raise your hand if you would like to introduce yourself or your guest. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Hello, yes, I'd like to introduce my cousins. We have Joy Hoffman from Minnesota, and we have Tim and Marie Schoenholz from Vermont, and we have Joy and Marie from Minnesota. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Yes, Judy. Hi, Terry. Welcome. Anyone else? Okay. If you are not on the mailing list, please visit the UUCC website at uucambria.org so that we can keep you informed about all of our activities. Members and friends, please check out what's happening. The eblast sent to you every week. This is a great way to keep up to date with our latest news. If you wish to see this or any of the past Zoom services, the recordings can be found on the UUCC website and on Facebook. And again, good morning and welcome to everyone. The affirmation is both a recognition of the nature of this community, as well as a promise to which we aspire. Let us now recite the UUCC affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in freedom and to help one another. We set aside this time for any special announcements that would be of interest to our UU community members and friends. Please keep your items short and to the point. If something needs more explanation, contact the person after the surface. If you'd like to make an announcement, please raise your hand. When Andy or I call your name, please step up to the podium or unmute yourself, then speak. Dolores? Most important announcement is the coffee's finally ready. Okay, and uh, tomorrow is a board meeting at three o'clock here in the sanctuary or on Zoom. If you wanna come on Zoom, send me an email. And also uh, I have the agenda for tomorrow on that little whiteboard back there. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, a general announcement from the UUA world. Um, starting tomorrow, Martin Luther King's birthday, the UUA celebrates what they call 30 Days of Love. Uh, there are a lot of activities, both in person and online, that are available to um, participate in that process, and uh, some of them might be interesting to you. If you want to check that out, the website is sidewithlove.org. Okay, sidewithlove.org, and you can show, uh, you can uh, explore uh, any number of things that might be of interest to you. Uh, secondly, the Religious Education Committee is newly reinvigorated. Thank you to those who uh, joined in on the uh, Zoom meeting we had last Thursday. Um, we had an excellent meeting at which we decided on a couple of opportunities. Uh, one will be Oh, they're there already, sorry. One will be a book-like discussion, and we're going to begin with a nice uh, introduction to Unitarian Universalism. Actually, it's more than an introduction. It's a, it's a good dive into it. Uh, it's called The Pocket Guide, and it is uh, revised with each president. The, most, the latest revision is our most recent president, uh, Susan Frederick Gray. She was the editor of this version. We'll read a couple of those chapters in a circle and discuss. Uh, the meeting will be on uh, the final Wednesday of every month. I have th thought about that, Randy, and it still works. The final Wednesday of every month, uh, meaning the 31st in this case, uh, at 4 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Uh, and the program should last an hour and 15 minutes from 4 to 5, 15 p.m. on Wednesday, January 31st. And we'll repeat that monthly on the last Wednesday of the month. Secondly, we'll have an online, a Zoom RE activity based on TED Talks, um, some of which address spiritual and, and, and topics that are very interesting to Unitarian Universalists. Uh, each month we'll have a different facilitator who can choose a couple of those. As you may know, they only last, as you can see, this one lasts 16 minutes. They're all 16, 18 minute long talks by specialists in various fields. 
We'll watch one of those online and then discuss it online. So you don't need to leave your home if you want to join that discussion group for RE and religious education. And that'll be the second Wednesday of every month, same time, 4 p.m., again for an hour and 15 minutes. So I'll keep, keep reminding you, I'll put notifications in the what's happening to remind you of the specifics and we'd love all of you or as many of you as like to to join us. I think that's it. Sorry? Thank you. Oh, great. Thank And thanks to the committee. Thanks to the committee, which is an ever growing committee. Our core started out with Dolores, Catherine, Kat and um, Don Howell and myself and m many more are welcome. Any else in the sanctuary with announcements? I don't see any hands raised on Zoom, so back to you. Okay. Next week, Ingrid Perez will present Embracing Our Mortality, a Celebration of Life. Sharing together some of our personal and significant joys and concerns brings us closer as a faith community. We invite you to share the milestones that are deeply felt as a part of your personal life. Express a gratitude or perhaps offer an acknowledgement, but please be mindful and considerate of all who come to worship with us this morning. The collective flames of these candles embody all the joys and concerns which may have gone unspoken today but are also deeply felt in our community. The first reading are excerpts from two blogs posted on baynature.org and potomac.org. Nature and the environment aren't the first topics that come to mind when reflecting on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. The civil rights movement predated the environmental movement by a decade. As a visionary, King talked about many issues that touched on justice and spoke against the separation of moral judgment from technological advancements. King's legacy gave fruit to the environmental justice movement, which seeks to ensure the right to a clean and healthy environment for all people. He often framed issues in the universal terminology of the natural world. Here are three quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one destiny affects all indirectly. Never, never be afraid to do what's right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. We have flown the air like birds and swum the sea like fishes, but have yet to learn the simple act of walking the earth like brothers. Martin Luther King Day, which is tomorrow, is the only federal holiday observed as a national day of service. The legislation to make Dr. King's birthday a federal holiday was officially passed in Congress in 1983. Nearly a decade later, Congress voted to further the impact of MLK Day by designating it as a day on, not off. When honoring the memory of Martin Luther King Jr., be sure to spend some time in nature, honoring the interrelatedness of all life. Let us enter a place of peace and serenity where you are one with your spiritual being. Be at peace with your space where the absence of all that is temporal and its most is its most cherished gift. Let us enter the stillness.
when love and compassion are present in us and we send them outward, then that is truly prayer. Further, in sending love outward, may we notice a change in our own hearts. The second reading is from a National Oceanic and Administration Administration blog titled National Marine Sanctuaries. NOAA's System of Marine Protected Areas Protect Marine Ecosystems Throughout U.S. Waters. National marine sanctuaries are federally protected underwater areas encompassing marine and freshwater ecosystems around the nation. Some sanctuaries protect breeding and feeding grounds for endangered whales, while others contain thriving coral reefs or kelp forests, and many are home to historic shipwrecks and other archaeological treasures. NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries serves as the trustee, managing this national network, encompassing more than 600,000 square miles of U.S. Ocean and Great Lakes waters. There are presently 15 national marine sanctuaries and two marine national monuments. The goal of the sanctuary system is to protect important natural and cultural places, while allowing people to enjoy and use the ocean. Few places on the planet can compete with the diversity of national marine sanctuaries, which protect America's most iconic natural and cultural marine resources. In California waters, two island chains are protected by national marine sanctuaries, the Channel Islands in the Southern California and the Farallon Islands in Northern California. Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary protects an undersea embankment near San Francisco, a major upwelling center that provides food for millions of migratory fish, marine animals, mammals, and seabirds. Off the coast of Monterey, the Monterey Submarine Canyon, deeper than the Grand Canyon in Arizona, influences coastal ecosystems for miles and is largely responsible for the healthy marine ecosystem we see off our own Cambria coast. National marine sanctuaries work with partners and stakeholders to promote responsible, sustainable ocean uses that ensure the health of our most valued ocean places. A healthy ocean is the basis for thriving recreation tourism, and commercial activities that drive coastal economies. Please stand in body or spirit and sing Blue Boat Home, number 1064.
Today's talk is titled, National Marine Sanctuaries, America's Underwater Treasures, to be delivered by Michelle Roost. Michelle Roost is a marine biologist and science educator. She teaches part-time in the biology department at Cal Poly, and she works part-time for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary out of a field office in San Simeon which is also the Coastal Discovery Center at San Simeon Bay, located at San Simeon Cove across Highway 1 from Hearst Castle. Michelle has a passion for teaching people about the natural world, both on land and in the sea. In October 2023, Michelle received the John Laird Lifetime Achievement Award for Environmental Stewardship from the Central Coast State Parks Association. Michelle? Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. What a lovely service you offer here. It's really special. I'm very glad to be invited to share it with you and share my knowledge about National Marine Sanctuaries. I'm Michelle Roost, and as mentioned, I work up in San Simeon. I don't know if any of you have been to the Coastal Discovery Center at San Simeon Bay, little nature center there. I work out of the office, which is adjacent to it. I'm a community liaison, which means my job is to listen to the concerns of the community and relay them back to our headquarters in Monterey and deliver information from Monterey to our community. So that's what I'm here to do today. And this is a wonderful opportunity to spend a moment thinking about the meaning of the word sanctuary. Uh, obviously, sanctuary has different meanings in different um, communities. Here, we're in a sanctuary, a place of refuge, of protection, um, a place where people can come to rest and be rejuvenated. So it's interesting how that meaning can also be related to protecting life in the sea. National marine sanctuaries are areas where the marine environment is so special that it needs to be protected. We happen to be very fortunate to live in a beautiful area. And those of us who live here, we love going to the beach, walking along uh, the coastline, enjoying our coastal trails, we, are, we love our beautiful spaces so much, and we're so glad that they have federal marine protection. Not something that everybody's familiar with, but it's very important. So in uh, 1992, this section of the coastline was recognized as one of America's underwater treasures, part of uh, the spillover from the upwelling produced by this Monterey submarine canyon 100 miles north of here, but also other submarine canyons uh, along the coastline of Big Sur. So St. National Marine Sanctuaries are areas of the marine environment with special conservation, recreation, ecological, historical, cultural, archaeological, or aesthetic qualities. That's a big mouthful. But in order to qualify as one of America's underwater treasures, an area has to be recognized as many of the factors here on this list. And certainly, I think we would all agree that the coastline off of our coast meets many of these qualities. The Na Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, which is under NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and OAA, we are the trustee for maintaining and conserving these special places for future generations. So as a trustee, we have the responsibility, we have an obligation to protect and preserve these designated marine sanctuaries uh, through so that they can be enjoyed and so that they can continue to grow and re reflect the biodiversity of the history of them. One of our first National Marine Sanctuaries was actually the wreck of the USS Monitor. Those of you who are historians remember the Ironside that went down in the 1870s in a storm 
and it was at that time lost at sea. When the wreck was discovered, it was in only 378 feet of water and divers had the technology to go down and plunder it. But it was, it's also a US Naval burial site. 17 souls lost their lives in that wreck and it needed to be protected. It was the first National Marine Sanctuary. It's one square mile and it simply protects a very important piece of America's cultural history, human history. So it doesn't have to be an environmentally special place. It can be any place under the surface of the water, both in the oceans and in the Great Lakes, that has special significance to the United States. So we balance the ability to get into these places. Uh, there are many shipwrecks in the Great Lakes region that are now protected as national marine sanctuaries, even though they're not oceanic. And uh, those wrecks are part of our cultural heritage, but they're also great places for people who like to dive. So balancing, enjoying, and recreating, and learning from these special places with protecting them from being overused or loved to death as uh, some of our tide pools are. So we work to create that healthy balance of appreciation. We also know that healthy oceans make for healthy economies. People like to come here, go whale watching, kayaking, surfing. They're not worried about water pollution or contamination of our ocean. So it's important to keep our ocean healthy, to keep a healthy coastal economy. And more than anything, loving and appreciating where we live. And you guys do an amazing job of that here, appreciating what we have, appreciating where we live, and developing a sense of stewardship. Not only do we entrust the federal government to protect these places, we each as individuals take on a responsibility to appreciate and look after and protect these places that we call home. This is a fairly small picture, uh, but you can see that there are National Marine Sanctuaries throughout the United States coastal waters, also in the Great Lakes region, two in the Hawaiian Island chain, and one off of American Samoa. And these are protected. The circles represent National Marine Sanctuaries. The triangles represent marine national monuments, which are really essentially protected under the same system. They just designated somewhat differently. And you can see along the coast of California, we've got uh, first in Washington, the Olympic coast, then the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, Cordell Bank, Monterey Bay, which we're a part of. We're in the Southern region of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Channel Islands, which of course is offshore, and then in between those two is a yellow square. There's a proposed National Marine Sanctuary right here in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. I'm just gonna to touch on it briefly today, but PJ Webb, who was one of the founding proposers for that sanctuary, will be here on February 4th to give you an update on the status and the process. It's really been quite amazing to watch that process uh, it doesn't happen very often, and here we are. We have a front row seat watching the proposed designation of a new marine protected area along off our coastline. Great. So let's zero in a little bit closer. This is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. As you can see, it goes all the way up to San Francisco, stays outside of the harbor and comes all the way south, all the way down to Cambria. We're so lucky. In fact, the southern boundary of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is on the Bluff Trail at the Fiscalini Ranch. If you go to the north end uh, of, the, of the ranch and you start walking the Bluff Trail just a couple hundred feet down, you'll see a wheelchair bulb out with a sign and the sign points to a rock, and that rock is the southern boundary of the Monterey Bay, the largest national marine sanctuary in the continental United States. 
or very, very large sanctuary, as you can see, more than 276 miles of coastline, encompassing all of Monterey Bay, coming down from San Francisco, Half Moon Bay, Santa Cruz, the Monterey Bay, and all the way down the Big Sur coastline to where we are, the Southern Gateway to Big Sur. And you can see that right there at the apex of the Monterey Crescent, a deep sea canyon, that's the Monterey Submarine Canyon, one of the deepest parts of planet Earth. And it comes right off of Moss Landing, if you've ever been to that area, gone to Phil's Fish Market or the whole enchilada for lunch, that is where the, uh, the, the Submarine Canyon begins. So you can see the widest part of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is to encompass and protect the maximum of that canyon. But there are also some submarine canyons south of there. You can see them off the coast of Big Sur. And we also have, it was the um, recovery area for the California sea otter, the Southern sea otter. And also it encompasses Point Piedras Blancas, several shipwrecks, that wrecked around Point Piedras Blancas. It includes the elephant seal colony, which was just getting started, uh, hadn't even quite uh, gotten started in 1992 when this area was designated, and all the way down to our neighborhood, our neck of the woods. Very exciting. It's something I'm very proud and pleased to represent. So what makes our sanctuary so special? I know for some people, naming is, the, is a problem. You know, Monterey Bay, they're so far north, 90, to, 90 miles from here. Why couldn't they name it the Cambria National <laughs> Marine Sanctuary? <laughs> and naming is indeed a challenge. And that's why, of course, it's named for a geological landmark, the Monterey Submarine Canyon. Uh, we don't have something quite that exciting here in Cambria. So what is so special about it? Let's have a look. We have diverse habitats. As may, some of you may have heard, some of the kelp forests in Northern California went through a decline recently. They're starting to recover. So the next time you go out and you look at the kelp forests right off our co coastline, be glad for those. They, they're not a given. They could be affected by pollution or by uh, a disease. So we're lucky that we have these kelp forests here and they enhance the biodiversity, the fish species that come there and spend the summer, they breed and produce offspring. Even in the winter now, when these big winter storms are breaking up those kelp forests and bringing them to shore, when you're walking along the beach now, you see these big, what's called a kelp rack. Well, the kelp flies love that. They feed on that old kelp they reproduce and they produce millions of flies, which are fed upon by the migrating shorebirds who come here in droves. This weekend, of course, the Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival. This is an amazing place for birding. It's considered a globally important birding hotspot. So just really a remarkable abundance in part, thanks to the sanctuary. We also have coastal upwelling. And as the name suggests, this is when water comes up from the deep and it hits the coastline and it starts to cycle around. Deep sea canyons allow that water when it comes up, it brings nutrients with it and spills over the edges of the canyon. So we have upwelling both from the canyons as well as coming up off of the continental shelf, which brings nutrients and cold water. That's what serves the entire ecosystem, the whole food web, starting with microscopic phytoplankton, the plants of the sea, sucking up carbon and producing 50% of the oxygen that we breathe on Earth. The other half, of course, being plants on land. But the protists, the phytoplankton of the sea, do their share to provide us with healthy oxygen. They, in turn, are eaten by uh, zooplankton, tiny microscopic animals, which are eaten by the little fish, and then the bigger fish, and all the way up to the marine mammals and the whales. We're so lucky to live in such an abundant place. In the summertime, late summer, we see the humpback whales 
feeding on the midwater fishes, the anchovies and the sardines. The gray whales migrate along this coastline down. They're having their calves right now in Baja, California. Then in uh, March through May, we see the cow calf, the mother young pairs traveling north along our coastline. We're so fortunate to have this abundance. It doesn't happen everywhere. We are a migratory center for many migratory species. I don't know if you can see, but all the way from New Zealand, sooty shearwaters, they're a seabird that travel through here. You see them clustering off the coast in August. There's so many of them, millions and millions of birds spiraling offshore. They almost look like a, a flies. They're so tiny, but that just means how far they are. And there's millions of them, again, feeding here as they fatten up before their big trip to New Zealand, where they have their nesting uh, areas. Also, leatherback sea turtles born in Indonesia. They follow the jellyfish. It's hard to believe the largest turtle in the world, getting up to seven feet long, feeds on exclusively jellyfish. And where do jellyfish congregate? along the coast of California in the summertime where all that abundant food is available for them. So the leatherbacks travel all the way across the Pacific and show up here in September. We're so lucky to have them. We have deep sea canyons, including the Monterey submarine canyon. And also we have an undersea volcano, the Davidson Seamount. And if you can tell the see the slight red boundary there, it's directly west of Cambria San Simeon. It's a huge mountain, 75 miles from shore, almost 8,000 feet high, bottoming out at 12,000 feet, more than two miles below the ocean surface. Just an amazing upwelling center. New species are found every time they send an expedition to explore it. We also have incredible human history. Uh, the Wreck of the Montebello, the History Society here in Cambria has a good story about uh, an oil tanker that was torpedoed in 1991, 1941 by the Japanese during uh, the war. And also the Wreck of the USS Macon, the second to last of the naval dirigibles that went down in a storm in Big Sur in 1933. Its wreck wasn't discovered until the early 2000s. We've now done research on that wreck. And of course, historically, it's an incredible place for fishing, incredible abundance of the sea. We protect these resources using simple tools. Our resource protection is the bottommost circle there. We actually are a law enforcement agency. We have laws, and if you break those laws, you will experience the consequences. We do research and monitoring. We've sent more research expeditions to the Davidson Seamount than any other research institution in the world so that we can learn about it. We work in partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute to explore the Monterey Submarine Canyon and education and outreach. That's me, that's what I'm here for. Not only do we wanna learn about these special places, we wanna share them with others. So what are the rules that aren't allowed? Uh, these things should be pretty straightforward to most of you. We don't want you to dump in a marine protected area. We don't want you to destroy the seafloor. Uh, we don't want you to disturb cultural reef resources like Native American sites or wrecks of important vessels. And we don't allow exploration for uh, minerals such as oil, natural gas, and other minerals. So those are the primary rules and regulations. There's a few others along the way. For example, in the Monterey Sanctuary, they really don't want you to go chumming for white sharks, which is actually attracting white sharks by putting you know, the, what they like to eat in the water. The surfers didn't think that was a good idea and we didn't either, so <laughs> that's not allowed. We do have a visitor center. You have to come up and visit us in San Simeon at the Coastal Discovery Center. Uh, it's a great little, very small uh, visitor center. If you have grandchildren, they will love it. 
So please come up and visit us sometime. We're only open Friday, Saturday, Sunday from 11 to 4, but we'd love to see you on those days. The rest of the week, we do school groups. We run lots of school groups through the Coastal Discovery Center. And I'd like to, I'm going to skip this slide and come back to it, invite you to join us as a volunteer. We have volunteers from this community, from Cal Poly, uh, who come and visit, work, interact with thousands of people a year. Uh, it's not quite as difficult as the elephant seal volunteering, which is outdoors. Ours is inside. Uh, so come and have a check out our facility and see if it's a place where you'd like to spend some time meeting our visitors. And finally, I'd like to close with, and that, by the way, that's my contact information too, if you want to reach me, michelle.roost at noaa.gov and my phone number. And this, I believe, will be posted so that it's available for people to check into. Finally, one last word on the proposed National Marine Sanctuary. Very interesting. Uh, so you can see that it, the red is the proposed sanctuary, and it starts at the southern boundary. Right now, it was proposed to be started at the southern boundary of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary. So we literally would be able to straddle two sanctuaries, one foot in the Monterey Bay, one foot uh, in the proposed Shumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. It's not clear if that's exactly the way it's gonna go. We've had some public input that suggests lowering it down a little bit to make room for the blue triangle there, which is the proposed wind farm. And that wind farm is in process, but it's not as far along as our sanctuary program. So as our proposed sanctuary. So they have requested that we move the boundary we had a public comment period from August 25th to October 25th, and we received over 90,000 comments. Some of them in big groups, for example, the National Audubon Society submitted uh, a paper with 18,000 signatures in support of. A majority of those comments were in support of, so there's a very good chance that the sanctuary will be um, completed or designated. Uh, we're hoping to have that happen sometime in this year, 2024. But we don't know yet about the northern boundary. And also the name is confusing for many. It's pro it was proposed by the Northern Chumash Tribal Council. So not surprisingly, they named it for them. But as was mentioned earlier today, this is land that was also occupied by the Salinan tribe. And so we need to honor their request not to override their cultural history with this name. So we're in the, in the process of weighing all those pros and cons. It will go uh, through our Monterey office, and then it will go to uh, our headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland, which will review the, the draft management plan and the draft environmental impact statements. And then it will go to members of Congress for final review and voting. So we'll wait to hear about that process. I know I took a little longer than I thought I would, but I appreciate your patience with me. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. I'd like to open up any uh, I'd like to open up for a five-minute Q and A uh, for those people who would like to uh, ask some questions. Please go ahead. Hi. I just wanted to ask about the, um, the moon farm. That's the South area. And is that, do you mind um, sharing your feelings about that? Is that, that definitely going Oops. in? Oops. How far right. out is it? And will it have any impact on <sighs> So good question. What is the wind farm all about? And what do we know about it so far? We don't know a lot about it. There were three leases that were sold in January of last year. So just a year. It's they're very early in the process. The agency involved is a sister agency. NOAA is not the lead agency. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or BOEM is responsible and they are not as far along in their process as the sanctuary is. So they have asked that we create a pathway for construction. As you saw with the regulations, uh, some of the things that would be involved in building a wind farm, an offshore uh, facility of any kind, would be incompatible with our sanctuary regulations. So they asked for us to create a gap, and that's the proposed gap. 
Um, but at this point, there's pros and cons. There, another option would be for us to bring the boundary all the way up to Cambria and then to provide permits just during the construction process and essentially create an exclusion for them to be able to do their building. But they are so far away from being able to have an impact statement that it would be at this point, they can't tell us what they're gonna need. Well, Davidson Seamount is there, you can see that, and it's about halfway out to Davidson Seamount. It's an estimated between 30 and 50 miles from shore. It would not be visible theoretically from our coastal zone. There are a couple of questions online, so when you get a chance. Yeah, that's a great question. What is the smaller Cambria Marine Protected Area? Now that's in state waters that goes out to three miles. And that's a uh, part of the Marine Life Protection Act, which was passed by um, voter initiative in 1999. So this is a series, a network of 124 stepping stones in state waters to protect those areas that limit some allow recreational fishing, but not commercial. Some are no-take zones. And those have been uh, instituted for more than 10 years. And they're showing that those little MPAs create an abundance of fish that spill out out of those MPAs and enhance fisheries and biodiversity in the coastal zone. So that's what you're seeing. That's actually a state MPA. We're a federal MPA. We, we go out quite a bit further. Here's a question from Hank. Go ahead, Hank. Hi. Uh, terrifically informative. A question uh, that comes up rarely uh, for some of my friends as well as myself is it's supposed to be a marine sanctuary, but you reach inland miles and miles and miles. And I, I keep hearing from friends who are farmers, you know, that, you know, you're trying to reach 20 miles inland or more. And what is the inland extent of which you have authority to uh, impose your own additional regulations or review processes? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, the fact is that we know that whatever flows to the ocean is going to flow into the sanctuary. And so we have a whole water quality team that works with farmers and ranchers to ensure that the runoff from farms that may involve herbicides or fertilizer uh, is kept to a minimum, and the program has been very successful. It's received how far, a award. How far inland is that, was my original question. How many miles do you allow yourself to, uh, to impose your authority? We don't have authority in, water, in fresh waterways. Our authority begins and ends at mean high tide. We work with partners, okay. farmers, and uh, ranchers to voluntarily modify through education part of what our education and outreach program is all about. Right. Last question, Randy? Okay, um, you made a lot of remarks about the canyons and so forth. Um, without those canyons, would we have any more diversity? Now, what if we just, if the canyons, if the canyons didn't exist, what, what would it look like out there? Well, areas where there's just a flat sandy bottom to seem to be less diverse than areas that have a topographical variety to them. Yeah, why is that? The geology affects the oceanography, affects the biology, to, to give you a little catchphrase that I use with my students. Uh, the geological variation, the variation of the rock and the land creates a variation in the water patterns the currents and the air water flows and those currents and water flows can contribute to abundant biodiversity which supports a more diverse food web that's a big component to this, uh... yeah that's one of the things that makes it one of america's underwater treasures not every place meets the criteria for that designation the uh, proposed shumash heritage national marine sanctuary looks at the incredible shumash heritage and their relationship to the ocean and to the Channel Islands. So this is uh, that proposal has more to do with the cultural history, but there are also some amazing ecological 
treasures in the area that's been proposed. Jeff has a question online. Yeah, we, we need to move it forward. So um, can we can we postpone that question until can, we submit, can people submit questions to you? Yes, of course. Your... Yeah. 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 At my email, which is right there. You're welcome to contact me. And I'm also available to, to meet with any of your other organizations. I'm an outreach and education specialist, so that's what I do. Happy to help. Thank you. I'm sure Michelle can have to answer your question in person. Thank you so Thank much. You. The morning offering will now be given and received. Please remember we are a self-sustaining congregation and provide all financial resources for our many ministries. We recognize the spiritual value of generosity and invite you to participate. If you are viewing this service remotely, please use one of the methods on the screen. Thank you. Thanks for all gifts given and received for the work of this community. Please stand in body or spirit and sing the closing hymn, <laughs> Octopus's Garden by Ringo Starr.
That was great. As we prepare to extinguish the chalice, let us recite the valediction. The flame of this chalice will no longer burn today, but the light of the flame within our hearts continues to shine brightly, illuminating the love felt in our community. Please extinguish your chalice at home now. Now let us form a circle and join hands. Michelle? Thank you, everyone. This is a wonderful moment of stewardship here within this community that spills out just like a federal marine protected area or a state marine protected area. The stewardship and the compassion and the preservation that goes on in a place like this spills out and benefits everyone in the community and helps enhance the quality of life for all living things, just like in a national marine sanctuary. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.